So you kids know when I started this YouTube endeavor, my challenge, like it is every time I'm around you, is to always get you to ask the right questions, right? And you know the quote that I read years ago that I like, which is that the beginner chases the right answers, the master chases the right questions. And it's an art form. So I think it's important to start with that because if I could start the Bishop Barron video over again, I would have done it differently. I would have started with my main question, which wasn't really addressed in any of the comments. And that is if you have two individuals and they're similar in enough ways that the analogy works and you have one who says, I hate God, I hate civilization, I hate myself, I will never marry and I will never have children. And you have one on the other side that says, I love God and I wanna be in service to him. And for that reason, I will never marry and I will never have children. Is that an equation that can be solved? Do those two things, can they exist in the same space? Can two people do the exact same thing for different reasons and get an altogether different result? I'm not sure that they can. And this is the basis for my argument that this is not an anti-Catholic slam. It's uh, an awareness, the woke word, of the wokeness that is seeped into some spiritual doctrines. Awareness of things that we would not tolerate inside of the walls of our own home, with those we love and care about. We would kind of turn a blind eye to them in the world because we can't control them. But we go to church and we ignore them tacitly accept them or we advocate for them. And I think that there's an incongruency there that I want to address in a little more detail here. So I got to warn you kids also that when you talk about these things as you get older, and I'm doing this here as a one-sided debate because none of the commenters are here. I don't have anyone online to debate with about, maybe I will at some point in the future, but it's in the spirit of asking good questions, not to slam or malign or make people feel inferior for their beliefs being different than someone else. And I want to do this by focusing on three main issues that came up in the comments. One, Matthew 19 and the eunuchs. This is a big one. I don't think the scripture is being used correctly, and I do not think it does any justice to someone like Bishop Barron to compare him to a eunuch. That's not a nice thing to do, uh, and I'm not the one doing it. I just don't think people should do it. Number two, if it's relevant that Jesus wasn't married, which was mentioned a lot, and if it's relevant that Peter is married or was married, which is not mentioned at all. So we're going to call that checkbox fallacy. We'll go over that. Number three, marital substitution. And this kind of sets the groundwork for the woke thing because wokeness is about pretending. Wokeness is about substitution. Wokeness is about converting things from what they are to what people want them to be, whether it makes sense or not. So the idea of substitution, and let me talk about wokeness a little bit too. Wokeness is rebellion, pure and simple. Wokeness is making rebellion fashionable, making it modern, dressing it up, uh, so it's the rebellion du jour. And if I had to put it in a bumper sticker, I would say wokeness is rebellion, masquerading as virtue, writing on the back of moral superiority. Let's write that down. It is rebellion. If you look at the things that woke people are pushing and the things woke people do, you have two choices usually when there's something in front of you. You can do something that'll get you closer to God or further away. It's not very often, if ever, that the woke answer is the one that takes you closer to God. But it's disguised that way. It's masquerading as virtue and it's on the back, writing on the back of moral superiority. So uh, let's get to the comments and let's start doing some work here. All right, um, coming down. A couple that I liked, so I'll start with the good. A couple I didn't like very much, so let's go to Thomas Jerome. Initials are TJ, so obviously he's a great guy with great taste and highly intelligent. I like him already. Let's go through this quickly. Uh, Priest, do not disregard the commandment to be fruitful and multiply the earth. It's just the way in which they fulfill that command that's different from layman. This is number three, substitution. Just as man and woman have a nuptial relationship with each other, so too does a priest have a nuptial relationship with the church. This signifies the relationship Christ toward, has towards the church. Priesthood is a lived reality of communion with God in the world to come, whereas marriage between man and woman is a sign that points towards the ultimate communion with, communion with God in the world to come. This reality doesn't exclude priests from being fruitful and multiplying the earth, this is just manifested in a different way. Priests are spiritual fathers and are fruitful by multiplying the number of those incorporated into the church, children of God, and do so via the sacraments where priests work through Christ from the Father to bring forth new life. Just as man and woman come together in the procreative act and bring forth new life from the Father. Disclaimer, I'm not sure, I'm not Asher, Asher, I'm not sure if that's the church's official view on this issue. Um, Thomas Jerome, TJ, this is the best comment that I got on this video. I think it's very persuasive. I actually think it's got a lot of merit and it's an argument that I've never really heard before. So bravo for that. Uh, do I agree with it? No, I don't because I'm going to get into this a little bit. When I talk about wokeness, this answer has elements of that. And I think it's necessary for it to have it for this argument to stand. I don't think it can stand on its own. Uh, disclaimer, I'm not sure if that's the church's official view. Uh, maybe it should be. It's pretty good. And I also like his honesty and his sincerity. So... I'm going to be honest and sincere as well. 
the substitution, right? If I am a man biologically, physically, spiritually, and I want to identify as a woman, I can do that. And people are going to call me crazy. They're going to say it doesn't make sense. They're going to say I have license to do it, but it's a stupid decision. And then I jump over here and I identify as a woman. I act like one. I talk like one. And then I demand that you, and nowadays under penalty of law, uh, exceed that request or exceed to that request. And you can be punished if you don't. This is the substitution of wokeness, right? You have to pretend. And now I can pretend, but now you have to also pretend that my pretending is real or else there'll be consequences. So I'm very sensitive to any time there's substitution because in a war, the first casualty is always language. And so read through the language here and tell me what you notice. Priests do not disregard the commandment to be fruitful and multiply. They don't disregard it. They don't disobey it. They don't ignore it. They just fulfill it in a way that's different. See what's going on here? Just as man and woman have a nuptial relationship with each other, so too does a priest have a nuptial relationship with the church. Well, let's look up nuptial to make sure we're saying the same thing. Of relating to marriage or the marriage ceremony, of relating to or characteristic of mating or the mating season of animals, nuptial behavior. We well, you know what that means. Sorry, kids, you're still a little young, but you'll get there. So ironically, we're saying that they're not being obedient to that commandment in the way that Christ said. They're just doing it a different way. If Christ had said, do it this way, we should do it that way. But he said pretty clear what he was expecting, and they're not doing it that way. They're doing it a different way. That's one thing. Just as men and women have a nuptial relationship. So ironically, fathers are not married to the church. They're not really married to the church in the sense that a man and woman are married together, and they don't have nuptial relationships with the church the way a man and woman do. So you see a pattern here? We're like, we're calling it something to be similar to what else is called that way, but it's not really that thing. You have to kind of elaborate on how it kind of works the same way and how it has kind of the same effect. Go down to here. This reality, the reality, again, woke words, you have reality on one side, and then you have saying it doesn't exclude priests from being fruitful and multiplying the earth. It's just manifested in a different way. So reality is over here, and the way they manifest is over here, and neither the twain shall meet. Priests are spiritual fathers, not actual fathers, and are fruitful by multiplying the number of those incorporated in the church, which they could do if they were married. There's no need for them to not have a wife and kids to accomplish the thing they're accomplishing here. That's elaborated on a separate issue, but again, uh, number question number one, guy on each side doing the same thing for different reasons. Number two was the system of married patriarchs, prophets, and apostles that we had since the time of Adam until the time after Jesus Christ's death, not working in so much that it needed to be changed, right? And which system is better? Why does the ability to bring, incorporate children of the church of God into the church, children of God, through sacraments and bring forth new life have to be done by someone who's taken a vow of celibacy. It doesn't really address any of that. It just makes excuses for why it's okay for them not to do it the way they were told. Now, this is going to be a little harsh, but kids, this is important. Two years ago, we spent the whole year doing Old Testament study, and I got to teach the lesson on David and Saul. And my whole life, I had heard the David story every which way it could be told. I feel like I knew David like I knew the back of my hand. But I hadn't spent a ton of time on Saul, so I decided that year I was going to just talk about Saul. And the name of the lesson was, you're a lot more like Saul than David, because there are a lot more people like Saul than David. David was way up here, had gifts and abilities like nobody gets. But Saul, we all got a little Saul in us. We do. So when I was going to put this thing, when I read this comment for the first time, I thought, well, isn't a good example of what's happening here? And the first one that came to mind was Saul. He was commanded, this is in uh, 1 Samuel 15, he was commanded to wipe out the Amalekites, men, women, suckling children, and every living thing, livestock included. And Saul had recently just been on this celebrity trajectory, like A-lister, like he'd won American Idol. People loved him. He united the tribes for the first time in a couple hundred years. They were winning wars. I mean, everything was going amazing. And Samuel had already had a run-in with him where he did something he wasn't supposed to do. And that would be a really good video for another day because I don't blame Saul one bit for disobeying the first time because uh, it's a great story that happened to do with the first big battle that he won and the second one, which he almost won, but he disobeyed Saul, uh, Samuel. So going forward to this one, when he's already basically been threatened and been chastised by Samuel, he's commanded to go wipe all these people out, the Amalekites. And long story short, when Samuel saunters up after the battle's over, as he often does, and he's surveying the land a little bit, and Saul says, Hey, Samuel, what's up, man? Look how we did Victory, baby, victory, me and the Lord, getting it done. And Samuel had gotten a little message from the Lord before. 
This is verse 11 where it says, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be a king, for he has turned back from following me and have not performed my commandments. And it grieveth Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. He was sad. He had anointed Saul to be king. At this point, he realizes he's made a mistake. Why? Well, in verse 9, it says, Saul and the people spared Agag. He was the leader. I'm probably not saying that name right, but it's a cool name. And the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refuse, that they destroyed. So the good things, they kept. The bad things, they destroyed them. That's not what they were told to do, but it makes a lot of sense why they would do that. And especially as you dig into it further, why would Saul, a king, kill men, women, and infant babies, but not the animals? That's weird. I mean, if atheists come and attack you for reading this book where it's okay to massacre infant babies, sucklings, you got to defend that. But how do, you, how do you justify that with leaving the livestock alive? Well, it goes on a little bit. This is when Samuel walks up. And Saul says, blessed be thou of the Lord. I perform the commandment of the Lord. And Saul goes, psst, psst, psst. hold on. Do you hear that? You hear that sound? What, what is that? Saul's like, what? what you, I, I hear victory. I hear like, you know, spoil. I hear total, complete victory. The, God is good. And Samuel goes, oh, no, no, no. I want to read this <laughs> as it's written in the King James. What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of oxen, which I hear? which is code for WTF, man. What are the livestock doing alive? You just said you did what you were told. I see a lot of farm animals over there. So without even reading the text, you know where this is going to go. Saul is a king. Saul has some character flaws. Saul has some pride issues. Saul is supposed to offer sacrifice, which he's already done without permission, without the priesthood. Now he's got his whole armies there and they got all these livestock and they go, hey, we kept the good ones. And you know who wants the good ones? God does. We're going to sacrifice him and he's going to be really happy and everything's going to be good. And they're free. People don't have to use their own stuff. They can use the Amalekite stuff and keep their sheep. Not good. Not good. He's manifesting his obedience in a way that was not what was asked for. So Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he also hath rejected thee from being king. Samuel reach, Saul reaches out and grabs him. says, don't go, say it ain't so, and rips his garment. And Samuel says, the Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day and hath given it to the neighbor of thine that is better than thou. Ooh. Why did he keep the sheep alive? In verse 19, Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? So this is where we get into this question in this example, that if you say, priests don't disregard the commandment, they just fulfill it in a different way. They don't have a marital relationship like a man and woman have, but they have this nuptial relationship with the church, which really has very little definitionally in common because they don't, they don't serve this. They don't, they're not the same thing. But the kicker is this reality doesn't exclude priests from being fruitful and multiplying the earth. This is just manifested in a different way. They have spiritual children. I'm sorry. It doesn't pass the Samuel test. Samuel says God wants obedience, not sacrifice, which loops into the second thing here, which I see as a theme very often which is how much good these priests do. And I'm not arguing with that. I said that in my other video. They do a great deal of good. This one, I think. Here's all the things a priest does. These are so good. Well, how's that different than Saul explained to Samuel how much good he's done by preserving these? He's doing the Lord a favor, right? Except the Lord didn't ask for a favor. He asked for obedience. So that's number one. Thomas Jerome, TJ, great comment. I just think it's missing the point, which is that if the system we had for a long time was working fine, why did it need to change? When did it change? And why can't you do these things if you are married? Number two, let's talk about Matthew 19. As we look at these comments, Matthew 19. Uh, Matthew 19. Actually, i actually do this one. I hearted this one because Star Wars said he was going to clown on me, but then he watched it and thought I was being honest. I am. These are honest concerns. Well, Jesus did not say everyone is called to marriage. Matthew 19, for there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. 
let the one who is able to receive this receive it. I think the assumption here is that they're receiving this ability to be a eunuch. But it's interesting. That's not what he's saying here. Uh, actually, I'll come back to that in a sec. You keep pressing the no family all well in these verses of Baron. And well in all these years of Baron being a priest, he has helped so many people come to God. I think I can safely say thousands because every video has similar comments. Maybe. I'm not saying he hasn't. I never said that. I said it's a good thing. I'm saying, could he not do that if he were married? Why couldn't he? I'm saying, this is Saul saying, I'm not doing exactly what I was told, but I'm doing a lot of good the way that I want to do it. For rebellion is the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity. If he had a household, his attention would have been split on his household in advancing God's kingdom. Not necessarily. His full attention is on kingdom matters. Is that the case with every priest and every bishop? It's no guarantee. Also, priest being single isn't considered a doctrine, but rather a discipline. This is not a good argument. This means it's a practice not set in stone that can change if it's deemed prudent. And again, another tenet of wokeness. It can change whenever. We can make it whenever we want, however we want, which is why married men can become priests in some branches of the church and not others. That's not a strong argument for the doctoral certainty uh, that would be celibacy. All right, so Unix, let's go to my response here. Uh, ba -ba -bum. There are physically disabled. If I rephrase this scripture in more of a modern way, a eunuch is a person who is missing their goods. Christ is not disputing what a eunuch is. He's talking about different circumstances of becoming a eunuch. There are disabled people, physically disabled people. There are people who've had their goods cut off as punishment or by those with selfish, self-serving reasons. These are slaves for the most part. And finally, there are some who mutilate themselves thinking it will please God and make them more useful in his service. This is the third category. Those who've been made eunuchs, made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven. He's not saying God asked them to do it. He's not saying God did it for him. He's saying they made themselves eunuchs. They did this on their own. This goes back to the Samuel rule. I think... And by the way, this is in Greek and Roman culture where asceticism is a big thing. Stoicism is a big thing. This is where the ideas of God not having a body, not having any parts or personality or presence, because they looked at the flesh as a serious downgrade. There's no God up in the sky who could do the things that a God needs to do who would have anything in common with a mortal. It just couldn't happen. And this idea of God evolving into this spiritual nether came from these beliefs in the culture at the time. The church was being affected by the culture more than the culture was being affected by the church after the death of all the apostles. Um, this last person referred to is what is referred to, has what's referred to as a mental disorder. Christ is not, this is a pejorative. He's not being kind to these people. He's not saying this is what he wants. He's saying there are people born disabled, there are people made disabled, and it wasn't their choice, and there are people who are doing it to themselves. If we're going to use this example and compare a priest to a eunuch, then we should checkbox fallacy. We should go all the way. Shouldn't these priests be having surgery? A little scissors there. If we are applying the scripture in that way, shouldn't they be cutting the stuff off so they can be aligned with what Christ is teaching here? But the truth is Christ is not endorsing this behavior. It's a pejorative in each example. He's pointing out that bad things happen. Sometimes there's nothing we can do about it. And sometimes it's our fault. Christ would never refer to one, as, one of his disciples as a eunuch, nor instruct them to become one. He wouldn't. He wouldn't tell Peter to go become like a eunuch. It's not there. There's no, infer there's no implication that that would ever happen. So it's odd to me that someone could read the scripture and say, well, there's your proof right there that we should have celibate priests, which also is not a eunuch. It's not the same thing. So again, we have these definitional substitutions that are being used to connect dots that are too far apart to intersect or meet on their own. I got this comment again, and I wrote, this is a horrible diss. Christ is dunking on people he mutilated themselves. Again, this mirrors my argument of being spiritually blue-pilled. And she responded back and said, no, actually, he's not speaking of physical mutilation, but was commenting on those who choose to give all their energy to spread the gospel. Now, this is the same thing we're seeing in all these comments. Like, okay, that's not what's happening. He's He's doing something that the scriptures don't say. He's being told to do something the scriptures don't say. He's acting in a way that aligns with what the scripture says, even though that's not what it says. Like you have to make this leap. And the leap is where the problem is. The scriptures are the best interpreters themselves. It doesn't say any of these things. Uh, Christ himself did not marry. This brings us to our second point. That's true. This is checkbox fallacy. Christ did not marry in this life. Christ gave the law to get married when he was Jehovah in the, uh, in the garden. Christ uh, was sent here to atone for the sins of all mankind, which a priest cannot do. 
He came here to be the first person to be resurrected, which a priest cannot do. He came here to live a perfect life, which a priest cannot do. And he came here to forgive everyone of their sins if they accept him as their savior, which a priest cannot do. If the priest can't do all those things, why do we take the one thing the priest can do and say, well, see, Christ did it. So that's why the priest does it. I'm like, yeah, that's true. But we're trying to all be like Jesus Christ. I'm not going to go and atone for everyone's sins. So you can't pick the one thing that supports your doctrine and say, well, this is why we do it, because Christ did it. Because he was the only one, except maybe Jeremiah, who didn't do it. And more importantly, and this is not the topic for today's video, but there is a parable of a wedding feast in the scriptures. And I don't even think it's a parable. I think it's a prophecy of the great feast of the king's son, when everyone is invited, everyone's bidden, and few arrive. And it talks about an actual feast where they'll be wearing a wedding garment that the father provides them, and anyone who's not wearing the garment is there. You can look at that as a metaphor, you can look at it as a parable, or you can look at it for what it probably realistically is, which is a prophecy of what's going to happen in future events. When Christ, like every other one of his servants, including Jeremiah, who was promised marriage at a later date, but not in this life, will eventually, like the other commenter said, TJ, join in full communion with God. If you read John 17, the intercessory prayer, Christ talks about what his purpose is, what his mission is, why he's doing what he's doing, and what does he say? I'm doing this so they can become one with us, like I am one with you. And if you go further into this idea of oneness, it starts with the communion and the joint, the covenant of marriage, that we cannot be one without each other, and we cannot be one without Jesus Christ. And if we do become one, we will all become one together. So this is really my issue, is that to say, well, Christ wasn't married, so priests shouldn't do it either. It's a misunderstanding of what his mandate was here. They're also not gods. Christ was a little child of God, God was his father. Priests can't do that either. So I just think the checkbox fallacy uh, leaves a little to be desired. The children of God are spirit, not the flesh. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, and then it misquotes uh, 1 Corinthians 7, where Paul is giving advice to missionaries that are currently in the mission field about whether it's the appropriate time to marry. So I just said he gave three examples so you wouldn't be confused about his meaning. He did. Christ said, here's three examples of how people become eunuchs. So you can't take one of them and say, he's not commenting on that. He's saying these are people who give everything they can to spread the gospel. Everything? Everything they can? Priests aren't doing this. This is not what they're doing. Anyway, these are people that are physically deformed via various means. Are you aware that Corinthians 7 contradicts all of Paul's counsel about marriage elsewhere? Why do you think that is? I got no response for that, but that's a video for a different day as well. So those are the three main things I want to address here. This is the one about Peter. Do you think Jesus violated the command to be fruitful and multiply by doing so at a level that is higher than you would? Did St. Paul, did St. John the Apostle? This is another thing in terms of substitution. Paul more than likely was married. Not a lot of info about it in here, but to be where he was with the Pharisees would probably require marriage under their laws. We don't know what happened to his wife because it's clear he was not married as he was older. Whether she died, whether they got divorced, we don't. Whether she wasn't down with the Christian thing, we don't know. But also mentioning St. John the Apostle, of which whose marriage, like most of the apostles, is not mentioned at all. The only one whose marriage is discussed in detail is Peter, who is not mentioned anywhere in here, which again, because it's negative evidence. It's contrarian evidence that doesn't make the point that people here are trying to make. So, so my two questions still stand. Can one person hate God and refuse marriage out of hatred and another person love God and refuse marriage out of love and service? I don't think so. I think they got this one wrong. I think that there's a reason this doctrine wasn't codified until after 1000 AD. And I think, in the, and by the way, it's content for another video, but if we go back and we look at what was happening in the church at that time, I think celibacy was the right call. I think things were so out of control, that was pretty much the only option they had left. And they said, if we want men who are sanctified and holy, this is what they're gonna do, because it's the exact opposite of what was going on at the time. We're talking brothels, prostitution, incest, murder, I mean, really, really horrible things in the uh, 10th and 11th centuries, and coming up to the 12th. I mean, like five or six popes in a row who uh, would have been canceled on day one for the things they were doing. So I think at that time, in that context, it was probably the right call. In the thousand years that have passed, the since past, I don't think that it's continuing to work the way that they intended. I don't think it's providing the things that were promised. And I don't think it meets the qualifications or the justification of scripture for them to have done this. For the main reason being my second question, was the system of married patriarchs, prophets, and apostles not working so well that it needed to be changed? I don't think so. Uh, and if I wasn't LDS, and if we didn't have tens of thousands of members doing the things that they say that they're doing in the Catholic Church because they have full devotion to the church, then I'd probably be more persuadable on this. But I think it's a better system because I think it's a system that we always had and always will have, which is sanctification, 
through marriage, through family, through true fatherhood, and keeping the priesthood in the home where it belongs and keeping the best priesthood holders uh, with families. I remember, I remember, I remember. Okay, don't go anywhere yet. The last one, kids, was this idea of choosing between being a physical father and being a spiritual father. But the truth is, when you're a physical father, you're also a spiritual father. When you're just a spiritual father, you're not a physical father, and you may not be a spiritual father either, because they're not meant to be separated. I mean, you have this pattern that started with patriarchs, right? Adam was a patriarch, Noah was a patriarch, Enoch's a patriarch. What does that mean? They had the priesthood, and they had family. You cannot be a patriarch. There cannot be a patriarchy without a physical family. So my question is, why did they change it? Why did they make good men choose? Because when you make good men choose, good men are going to choose the best thing, which is to have a wife and a family. And the not as good men are going to choose the not as good thing. And you're going to have a church full of not as good men. You know, what I'm getting at with this. But if you look at the Catholic church, one of the big issues they have right now is there aren't enough Catholics. They're losing six for every one they gain. And part of the reason for that is because the way you get a lot of good Catholics is by having righteous, active, worthy fathers raising Catholic kids. I mean, they've done studies on this. I can't go into it today, but based on what the father does in the home, religiously, will determine what the kids do growing up more than anything. And so what they do, they take, and again, whose idea was this? They took the ostensibly the most righteous, the most dedicated and said, okay, leave the family and kids behind, go have spiritual children, be a dog parent. Ooh, that's not I mean. Be someone who's pretending to be a parent of kids, even though they don't have any of their own. Well, that'll about do it for tonight, kids. I did leave out that in Matthew 19, the verse immediately after the eunuch uh, discussion, little kids were brought to Christ and his apostles in their juvenile wisdom. Just, no, 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 no. He tried to rebuke him and get him away. And Christ said, suffer the little children and forbid them not to come unto me for such is the kingdom of heaven. It's pretty powerful, pretty powerful statement and pretty powerful indictment of their understanding of the role of children, the role of marriage and the plan that God has because they were on the wrong side of that one. And uh, if that's the case, then we need more children, which means we need more righteous, dedicated fathers, real fathers, physical fathers, spiritual fathers, not absent the physical part, not just spiritual fathers. Spiritual father for a child is kind of like a dog parent. It's not the same thing. <laughs> Should I say it? It's kind of like chest feeding. It looks like it and sounds like it, but it's not the same thing. The original recipe is getting better results than the modern recipe. If someone said, hey, Hailstorm, I want to have a dialogue. I want to have a debate with you. I'd say there's no reason to. Just look at the statistics. One is working and one is not. And one is uh, contributing to a decline. A decline which is totally reversible and needs to be for the sake of all of us. Love you, kids. This is the way. <laughs>